This is a public service announcement. This is a public service announcement. What you're about to listen to may make you yell, shout, smile, and even laugh out loud. Youth baseball players, coaches, and fans join the Slide Podcast crew on their journey to make baseball fun fun again. Hear stories from players of all ages, plus tips and tricks from coaches and scouts. Now, if you're ready, give us a loud play ball. Play ball. All right, welcome back to the Slide Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Aaron, and today we got two field reporters with us today. So we have Lila Brickwall Bratch and uh, Banana Sorry. Jake. How are you two doing? Good. Good, Lila. Good. Okay, there everything's great. Jake, you can throw again, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Slowly. So, so tell everybody like what happened, what you've been like, what, what you've been doing for the last few weeks. Uh, or so months. about six weeks ago, um, I was in a tournament and I felt some pain in my arm. And then two days later, we went to the doctor and I had X-rays done, and we found out it was a fractured growth plate in my shoulder which it was just from overuse so i mean i'm back now so good that's good now overuse obviously you're a pitcher but i mean you guys go by pitch counts and all that fun stuff right yeah but there was one weekend where i caught five games and that might have been there you go because you throw every time the pitcher throws unless there's a hit yeah so Wow. Okay. Well, good. You're back. Yep. So, Banana Jake's back, ready to go. So, Jake, you're back throwing. Um, how's your team doing so far? How have they been doing since you've been out? Uh, 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 we haven't been doing the best, but I think April has been our curse month. Oh, yeah. And I hope this month we be better because one of our top tournaments is in two weeks. Oh, yeah. East Cobb? Beast of the East. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the PG in Panama City, right? Yeah, our schedules just came out like 30 minutes ago. Oh, yeah? How How is it thing, How's it looking? Uh, The first game's going to be tough. Second game is going to be, I mean, I mean, the tournament isn't easy. There's a lot of good yeah. teams. And the second, ter- second game might be a little easier. And then the third game, the team used to be really, really good, but just gone downhill. So, I mean, oh, the fourth game, too is against the team that we lost last year in the championship game in the same tournament. So we'll hopefully get come back. All right. You want to you wanna go NFL style here and call out one of those teams and tell them they're going down? No, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you do it. <laughs> All right, Lila, let's, let's see if you can come off mute there and join us. All right, we good now? Yeah, we are good. We're good. Yeah. All right, what's going on in your world? Nothing much, really. I went to the Bananas game the other day. Oh, yeah. Sat- that was pretty fun. Ozzy got a ball. He was so happy. Yeah. All right, so you interviewed a lot of players, but tell me which one was your favorite. No offense to the others. Like, you guys are okay, but Lila, tell me which one you enjoyed the most. I think just probably Jocelyn because I can relate to her. Yeah. And, and, you know, we haven't released that uh, clip yet. It'll come this week. But you challenged her. You kind of challenged her there. If I'm not mistaken, you challenged her to a fight, right? Yeah. (laughs) And and she said, look, she's going to square up. She wasn't going to back down from a challenge. Lila, if you had to throw the mic down and, like, let's go now, like, that would have been that would have been yeah. the bomb. But it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. We, we don't sure. encourage violence here on the Slide Podcast. So we, we I, did fight. Just let you guys know. You did what now? We fought after. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. y- y'all must have thumb wrestled. We did. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, well, look, let me, let me ask you guys a question. So before we get to our guest, and actually um, our guest today may even join in on this conversation, but uh, for the first part of it, Jake and Lila, um, what's the S stand for in slide? Do you guys know? Support? And it's okay. Huh? Isn't it support? Nope, not support. All right, it's sportsmanship. Oh. Sportsmanship. 
And we're going to do a better job of talking through these things. So it goes sportsmanship, leadership, inspire, uh, dedication, and excitement. So, but let me tell you, let me tell you what I've heard. Um, I coach flag football and uh, my neighbor across the street, his son plays flag football and they're in, they're in the age group above us. Um, so they're in the majors division. And so what would you guys do if a coach decided to, or he, he goes to the commissioner and said he short some players on his team and he wants to bring up some of the younger kids on his, this coach coaches two teams. He wants to bring up players from the younger team to help support his team because he's short of players. Now, you guys would be cool with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, you know, you got you to gotta be able to play a game. Now, what if oh, yeah. you were the kid that was a part of that team, but you sat on the bench most of the game while those younger kids played in front of you? Tell me how you guys would handle that. Uh, just basically oh, yeah. like having a guest player and then sitting on the bench after the game. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a bad situation. So um, let's introduce our guest. So uh, joining us from California, um, Coach Josh. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. So oh, we're going to take back over here. So this situation, and, and this goes out there for all of our listeners as well. Tell me how you guys would have approached and handled this situation from the parent's perspective and or the commissioner's perspective. So there's what happened. Like, so literally, Josh, he, he pulled up some players, um, and then my next my neighbor, their kids set the bench most of the game while those kids played. Now, here was the objective. He wanted to win the game. Because, and these younger players were faster and, you know, had some talent. Like, that's, that's hard. That's hard for me to stomach, Josh. Yeah, I mean, I coached, I coached travel ball for the like, younger kids from ages um, 8 all the way to 13. And it wasn't until I think I got around 12-year-olds is where, like, guest players, guest players came a part of it. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't use them a whole lot. We always had a set 12 roster, but... You know, some people have things they go out of town for, they miss tournaments. And so for my, I always had, um, not necessarily, necessarily expectations, but when I had a guest player that we used, I notified those parents and that player ahead of time saying, hey, I'm missing this specific um, position. You guys play this position. You're gonna come in and fill this role. Um, but you're not, I hit everybody in my lineup. I don't do, even even right. at 13 years old for travel ball, I don't do subs, I don't do DA, I, every, everybody hits. And right. for guest players, they always hit last. Even if they're better than some of the other kids on the team, they always hit last. They knew you're gonna play this amount of innings if needed, but this is the reason why you come over and support us. If you're okay with it, great. If not, no hard feelings, I'll find somebody else, not a big deal. So going into right. the games, going into the tournaments, they knew what their role was that they're not going to play as much as their normal team that they're on. And so there is no hard feelings. All my parents knew how I operate. Nobody's, nobody's feelings got hurt because there was already a guidelines put in place before it happened. So um, I think what you're describing is what the culture of everywhere is right now when it comes to young sports of, you know, the developmental wise has gone away and it's more, I guess, trophy chasing is the word they use nowadays. But, oh yeah, ring chasers and trophy chasers yeah. and all. Of Not a huge that. fan of it, be honest with you. No, well, let me tell you. So you know, he had approached the commissioner before the game. Hey, I'm short some players. Let me bring these kids up, and then all this stuff transpired. Here's the part that just honestly, and excuse my language, just pisses me off, is because that when when this issue was brought to, you know, said commissioner, um, he offered him a refund. And that right there um, just just lit a fire. I mean, we're talking rec league ball here, like rec league flag football. And um, he, he said because this was the first offense for a coach, um, we couldn't punish the coach. And I am like, look, I, I don't know what our listeners are thinking, but like to me, 
that's a pretty clear and obvious conversation that you got to have. And I get that some people don't like having those conversations, but and my and my neighbors took the refund, and so now we have a coach that took the complete wrong approach um, with the wrong agenda in mind, and we got a kid out of the league. And I'm just I'm just oh my god! Anytime that kind of stuff happens. It just it fuels me up. So, anyway, look, enough of that. Sportsmanship. Got to have sportsmanship, Lila and Jake. That's that's important. Like, that's that's the skill set. I'll call that a skill set. That's the skill set that a lot of people's missing these days, even adults. So, all right. Coach Josh, Bakersfield, California. Um, done a lot of coaching. Um Man, tell us about yourself a little bit. I think you played some ball. I did, yeah. So <clears throat> after high school, I had some places that I was going to go play for. Um, Financial-wise, didn't work out. So I stayed pretty local, actually, to where Lila lives. So I went to Taft College for um, two years there. You know, going the JC route is pretty proper nowadays. It's cheaper. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually a little bit com more competitive at times, too, depending on where you're going. Um, their league right. at the time was pretty competitive and so I went there for two years my second year I, I hurt my back so I had back surgery when I was 20 years old which kind of threw wow. my yeah, kind of threw my things sideways a little bit um, I was able to rehab enough and then I went off to Cal State Monterey Bay which is a pretty powerhouse uh, national D2 school and mm -hmm. I just, I was never the same after the surgery. So I tried to hang out there, just tried to live up with the boys as much as I could, even though I wasn't playing. Um, graduated, you know, in 2015. And at that point I came back home. Uh, I got back to my, where I graduated from high school in the Pennants. I got back in the coaching staff there at Varsity, uh, coached there. And then I got involved in travel ball because I started getting into private lessons as well. So working one-on-one -on -one with kids. And mm -hmm. that kind of got me in the travel ball aspect of it. Uh, coach travel ball started when they were eight and, I, and me and my uncle who he started it I helped him coach it and we took that team from when they were eight kind of the whole group stayed together for the most part you lose kids here and there um, took them to they were 12 and went to Cooperstown and then after that the team kind of broke up and I kind of went on my own and went around to mm -hmm. these other programs and took another team to Cooperstown again and then I had a kid so that kind of stopped the whole travel ball experience, <laughs> had to be home more. Yeah. And I actually just finished my last high school game uh, last week, even though our team is going to playoffs, but because my second kid is going to be here next week. Um, so the coaching aspect, as far as on the field goes, I'm kind of retired already at 31, just because of family stuff. Right. But the whole one-on-one, -on -one, like working with Lila and a lot of my other clients, that's, that's my love of the game right there, man. I mean, you get an opportunity to specialize in one person, have a connection with them, get to see where they're at, see where, you know, have, I mean, Lila have videos and conversations all the time after games, break things down, even when I'm not there. So I'm always gonna continue the one-on-one -on -one aspect of it, but as far as the coaching goes, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much gone for now until maybe my kids get older, I might get back yeah. into it, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, look, I, you know, the first thing that caught my attention is back surgery at 20. <laughs> like, was that, was that like game related or like? Um, uh, I, growing up, I was competitive in a lot of things. I did competitive with horseback mm -hmm. riding. I did a lot of quads and oh, stuff wow. like that. So, and then I was a catcher. So, um, I was a catcher and it was one of the, I can't, it was one of our practices we were doing blocking drills and I went down a block and I, I just couldn't get up. And mm. it was hard to move. I couldn't walk. Couldn't get in a car. Um, and I was 20 years old, man. They, they offered the whole surgery thing, but they said, you're too young. We don't want to do the surgery. You want to kind of go through the epidural process, go to rehab. Been there. Yeah, they wanted me to go to the epidural cycle and then try to rehab it to see if I can fix it. And at that time, I was playing for, I think it's called like the CCCA. So you have like the Cape Cod mm -hmm. level of travel ball, and then you have like that yep. league is right behind it. So, you know, we're I'm local Bakersfield, man. You know, our team over here, we have guys that are around here. We brought some guys from out of state, but we were playing some teams that were like Division One players, so like a lot of really good wow. players. And I, yeah. I couldn't feel the pain, but I was told that you could notice it. Like I was running with a limp. I couldn't rotate as much. I couldn't feel it. So, did you slip a disc? 
Yeah, so or the way it was like the L3, L4, pretty much they're saying that um, the disc punched through my nerves, separated my nerves, and were going against my spinal cord. So they had to mm-hmm. realign all that stuff. But uh, yeah, ever since ever since I had the surgery, I just, I mean, I'm still in pain every now and then in the mornings. Usually when it's cold is the worst. Um, probably don't stretch as much as I should. Um, uh, yep. I play a lot of golf, which is not good for your back, especially the lower area. So that doesn't help either. But I don't yeah. know, man. It's one of those things when you're when you're taking when you're playing ball and you're really into it. I was devoted to the game. I was devoted to the work ethic. I I, I love the grind of it. Everything was there. You know, the facilities were amazing where I was at. So you know, all the strength and conditioning was pre-planned. All the food meals were done. And once the game's over, you get you get a little lazy. You know what I mean? Like. It's not all planned for you anymore, so you got to figure it out on your own just to stay healthy and fit. And I, you know, I've gotten lazy from it. Well, life happens. It's, it life does. Happens. You know, you get you have a kid, you put on the pounds too. So, um, but I stayed connected. You know, when I when I stopped playing ball, it was it was tough. You know, it's something you do your entire life. It's where you learn a lot of life lessons and where you meet a lot of friends. I'm still friends with to this day. So, the closest thing I could think of to stay connected to the game was coaching and. I've, yeah. I've met a lot of players. I've met a lot of parents, and it's been it's been fun. Yeah, Banana Jake, what you got for this dude? Uh, so you said you're a teacher, right? I am. Yeah. What's like? What's the best part of like coaching and teaching combined? Uh, the schedule lines up together. So, um. So being a coach at the school I teach, you know, I'm there for all the practices. I don't miss and stuff like that. But honestly, the best part is you're on the campus with your players. So I'm able to do a lot of things with our program. We have early morning hitting lessons. We have videos at lunchtime. We go over the opposing players and teams when we play them that week. We have a lot of film sessions here and there when we go over things. So just being on site with the players that you're coaching and having that you know, I can have constant check-ins with the grades, which is very important. In our program is maintaining high grades, especially for our seniors that have the ability to go play the next level. Um, stressing mm-hmm. the importance of every time a pro, every time a scout pro or not pro, we have a couple guys that got drafted, but mainly college scouts that have contacted me or our other head coach. You know, one of the main questions they ask us first is grades, and if the grades aren't there, they say no. We're going to move on to the next one. So. We want to make sure we maintain high grades in our players, and that's a stress important. So being a teacher on campus where I coach, that's probably the best part for me is to make sure our guys are staying accountable in the classroom as well as outside of it. Nice. <clears throat> I feel like that that's like the best way of doing it. I mean, you can really help shape, you know, a young player's life that way. I mean, you, you have influence over the education and have visibility to – you know, how they show up in the classroom as well as how they show up on the playing field. I think that's uh, it's, it's, it's honestly probably drives the players crazy. Well, it's one of those things. Like, I mean, it's also one of those things, too, like outside coaches who have, like, the grade check stuff. I, I've met teachers that don't like doing grade checks. It's just another thing they have to do is on top of the responsibilities yep. they already have. So being a teacher on campus and having those relationship with those teachers, they know where the intent's coming from. It's just not another thing on their agenda they're, they're checking off, but right. there's more of a care to it. So there's times too where they'll, they'll notify me, say, hey man, kid's messing up in class or he's misbehaving and stuff like that. And we correct it right then and there at, at practice. So whether it's you know conditioning extra or sitting out games or, or, other, or missing practice to go get some tutoring sessions done to make sure they get it done, they, our, our players know there's a stress level of if you don't get done in the classroom, it doesn't matter who you are, how good you are, or who you've been recruited by, you're going to have the same accountability as everybody else, and you'll miss practice, you'll miss games because of this. So yep. um, just things like that. Gotcha. Jake, what's your grades like? Let's just go ahead and throw it out there. Uh, I have all A's but two B's, but it's like 89 B's. So not all A's? Hold on, like. I, I'm pretty sure like 90 starts in A, right? Yeah, 90 to 100's A. So I'm not going to round up an 89? Yeah. <laughs> I, well, okay, it's my science and social studies class oh. that I well, really. You, you, you got you to gotta put in an extra 1% there, Jake. 
Well, according, <laughs> he, according, start, he started to defend himself. I saw it. According to my Lila, teachers. Adjust what? that camera up so I can see your head there. There you are. All right, Lila. It's your turn now. What's your grades like? Well, I got all A's right now. All right, y'all, 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 maybe just too smart, I guess. Cause look, I, I didn't, I didn't do that well. Like, well, actually, no, I take that back. I mean, listen, for first of all, when I was in school, a ninety was a B. All right, and so I don't know how you guys got the Lila. You making me sick here? Like, I'm, I'm. You, you, there we go. There we go. Um, I don't know how you convinced all school boards to change this whole grade scale, but like, it was like I want to say. A 94 started an A, and then a B started at 86, I think it was. Does that sound right, Josh? Were you on that same scale? No, we were normal grade scale. I mean, they they haven't made changes here in California as far as the grade scale goes. They made changes as far as, like, our math department last year took the D away. So anything less than a 70 is failing because it translates to college in that sense, as far as what their curriculum is. They brought it back though this mm -hmm. year, um, but they're talking about maybe taking it away again. So the, as far as the grade scale goes, when I was in school, it, it hasn't changed at all, I don't believe. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah it, it's it's big deal. So I, it, it's definitely changed. Anyway, great job, guys. You Thank guys you. get to stay field reporters, because that's a good idea. I'm, I'm going to have to start checking grades. So, because I can't be giving you extra work and extra assignments if you're not getting the basics done. But look, you guys got it down. So, I appreciate that. Um, so, Lila, I'm going to let you go. You know this dude. What, what should we know about him? Can't hear you, Lila. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. I don't know what it is no, then. You, you can't get far away with that with that microphone. You can't be far away from it. Hold on. So Josh has been coaching me for a very long time. And I've gotten to know stuff now, but the people out there know, what's your coaching philosophy? Hold on. We we heard about two words out of that probably. You got a Bluetooth headset? Mm. All right, well, we're going to have to make a call to Maggie, and we're going to have to invest Your in a Your mom has a Bluetooth headsets. Are you kidding me? Yeah, go see. I hate that for her, but it's, it's all right. We'll get her back. So now we're going to cut back in. All right, so, Josh, you, you spend some time in the travel ball world. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's most, you know, what's most relatable to us at right now. Mm -hmm. Um What'd you take away from that? Oh man, um, the good, the bad, the ugly. I think the goods of travel ball is still um, it's a way for kids to still stay connected with each other outside of school. In that sense, right. um, you still give them an opportunity to go to a place where. If you can find good coaching, it's a good fit because they get the extra help in that sense. Um, it's expensive in certain areas. It's hard finding the best coaches because a lot of travel ball, there's so many. Like I know our town has a bunch of travel ball teams and a majority of them are coach, coaches or parents. Um, I don't know. Every pissed off dad's got a, got a team these days. There's, so. it's, the travel ball world now is not what it used to be when I played it. So. I remember when I was playing, it was still expensive, the team I played for, but my mom sat me down one day when I, when I signed up for it, and it was, her simple philosophy was, I don't care if you guys win, I don't care if you lose. Um, what I care about is I'm investing the money into this because this team is putting you in positions out of town to face the best talent. And that's what I want you to take away. So when you come back to, your, to my hometown and I play in my leagues, I got to see better pitching. I got to, coach, I got to call games against better hitters. So... I'm more prepared. Um, nowadays in travel ball, it's, it's, it's all about winning. There's a lot of rotating players all the time, picking up players to fill on teams just to have the best to go win tournaments. Um, it's, it's hectic in that sense. It's, it's year round, especially when you get older. Like one of the biggest areas mm -hmm. of concern 
like with high school kids right now, especially pitchers, is the non the non rest that they take, and it's a back and forth with our guys because one of the things is is back when I was playing, you had your season, you went through summer in a sense, um, and then you took a break for a couple months of no throwing. You went through you know you went through the weight room, you went through uh, throwing programs, you went through core strength, you went through all these different things. You simulated bullpens, you worked on grips, you worked on spins, whatever it is you work on pitch-wise, simulated bullpens. And then once you got back towards season about a couple of months beforehand or two months, then you started to you know, go a little bit more. Um, but right. they don't stop. Like there's no stoppage in throwing. And then there's, they don't recognize no. their pitch counts. They're throwing 100 pitches every weekend and they don't calculate how many that is in a month and overall in a year, how many pitches are throwing. Um, I also think the hardest thing that I've noticed coaching, especially the 12-year-old and 11-year-old, is how coaches utilize pitchers. And what I've noticed is it's not, it's not the necessarily of how many pitches they throw over the weekend is what they look at. Like, that's how they go about pitchers over the weekend. Saturday, Sunday tournament, they're saying, you know, Johnny threw 50 pitches on Saturday. His hit limit's 100 for the weekend. He's good to go for 50 on Sunday. And the problem with that is, is my mind is, they don't take consideration all the extra throwing that takes place. So you're throwing right. when you practice, when you're warming up, those are throws. In the bullpen, those are throws. On the field, they're higher extreme throws. Then you, the next day, you do the whole process again. So instead of 100 pitches, you're throwing over close to 200 in that sense for 11, 12 year old. Like my, my pitchers never threw back-to-back days. If they threw 25 pitches to 35 pitches on a Saturday, um, if they kept that under a certain limit, then I would allow them to pitch the next day. But if they threw over 50 on a Saturday, they were done. There was no Sunday pitching right. because I just – I did it. I was a catcher and I was a pitcher. I knew what both of them did to your arm. And there's no – there's just not a lot of accountability. The stretching is not great before games. There's no – it's just – it's it's a lot different. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's – What I've noticed, and, you know, I've talked about this on the show, is, you know, in my area, you know, honestly, we're we're losing kids from our community rec league at the age of eight. And eight's going to travel. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I get it, like, better competition. Um, You know, I know of a couple even coaches that wanted to – wanted to coach an all-star game he didn't get the chance to do that he he started his own travel ball team um we we I mean just different situations and in those situations like you're saying like we're not educated on how to help the players take care of their body and and to me like we get asked a lot um from the show perspective is you know when should we go to, to travel and Josh, you can tell me what your opinion is. <laughs> My opinion is when you find the right coach. I Or, actually, let me ask you this. Do you feel like travel ball is a necessity today? If you talk to people, it is because you have to. I mean, yeah. our rec leagues in town, Northwest and Southwest, is our two rec leagues that we have, and it's it's not competitive at all. Like, it's not being rude to those players and those families, but like it's filled with players that don't make travel ball teams or not told right. they're not good enough and they're not going to play at all. So they have somewhere they got to go play. So that's kind of where they're at. And yeah. our, I mean, we have travel ball teams here that start at seven years old. I'm just, I'm looking at myself thinking you're putting your kids in a, in a position where they're getting yelled at all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've heard coaches yell at a seven, seven year old to throw strikes on the mound, and I'm just sitting there thinking, "What do you like? You think he's trying to throw balls? Like I don't, I don't understand. Yep. Like there's no thought process when it goes. I, I didn't, I didn't do travel ball until high school. So I mean, obviously it was different when I played. Like our all stars was the travel ball. So our rec league was travel ball pretty much. There's all the travel ball kids playing. They wouldn't have travel ball. So if you made the all star yep. team, then you travel to the coast and you play against their all. Yep. Like it's obviously it's different." I think um, for me, like hopefully my kids will want to play baseball, but I feel like unless times change, I, I don't mind if my kids play rec ball until they're 10 or 11, even if the competition is terrible. I, I want them to enjoy it. Like it's not me pushed upon yeah. them. There's so many kids I see when they get to 13, 14, they're just burnt. They're burnt out. Um, 
I mean, some of them enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. Some love playing every single weekend. Like, I'm sure Lila plays all the time. I'm assuming Jake plays a bunch as well. And it's just, it's a game they love to play with their friends and go do it. But, like, at some point, too, a 12 and 11 year old's tired of getting yelled at all the time for things that's out of their control. So. Yeah. Yep. Jake, what's, what do you see out there on the field? Or what, what do you, like, see from the crowd, the coaches? Because uh, you're in a pretty good organization. So. Um, but what do you see in it around you? Uh, like, like when I'm on the field. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just don't really notice anything. I yeah. just like focus on like the batter or like when I'm hitting. I just like when the like the pitcher raises his leg, I get into my set and I'm just like locked in normally. Yeah. And okay. I don't really notice how many people are in the crowd. Gotcha. Lila, are you back with us now? I think we're good now. I think okay. I, I think you are, yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Well, look, Lila, do you still play rec ball? No. No. Oh, okay. I'm playing. I do play. I'm playing this season, but this is probably gonna be my last season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's something to be said about rec ball because you know that that's really where the love starts. Like, I mean, that's where kids kind of, you know, learn to play with others and you know learn the spirit of the game a little bit, but. You know, Josh, like what you're saying, like the game itself is hard. Like, and as you move up, it only gets harder. And if you don't love the game, as it gets harder and harder, you're you're just going to bow out. And, you know, and I think that's where a lot of coaches, especially at the young ages, I mean, man, just chill. Let them love. Let them, let them fall in love with the game. And uh, I, I think you'll then you'll get into travel ball and you'll have players dedicated and committed to, to doing the right things. So anyway, Lila, let's go back to my question. What do like give us the juicy information here? What do we need to know about this guy? So um, I need to move your camera down so your face is in the. Oh, never mind. You're good. You're good. Yep, you're good. Go he ahead. covered. He covered most of it in the intro, but. So I've known this guy for a very long time. I know his coaching style, but just tell him about your co- coaching philosophy. Those guys out there want to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, uh, it's – I try to voice things in ways where they understand the game in a way that's not – yelling or putting pressure on them but you know being in an environment to get better so i mean my private my lessons one-on-one is it's 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 intense don't be wrong i push them hard but there's fun involved there's you know there's there's plans put in place of of what we're trying to do going forward and my biggest thing with them is understanding that look your parents are paying for you guys to go to this once a week and it's not cheap by any means and the biggest thing i always try to tell them i told lila is the 30 minutes an hour week you're going to get with your private instructor is going to be high quality for the most part who you're going to, I'm assuming. But you're going to get better over time, but your, your, your climb of what you want to get to is going to come from your work ethic outside of it. So mm-hmm. I, try to, I try to put all of, my, all of my drills in a sense to where they can do it on their own without anybody around. Once they get past a certain age with my clients, it's mandatory. They send me two videos a week of them working on their own. And if they don't, they don't see me that week. Um, because it's the philosophy is especially in the high school and travel ball has kind of made it this way in a sense is it's hard to work with kids in high school when they go through slumps um, yeah because when they go through slumps at, a, at like Lila and Jake's age it's it's a lot of yelling it's a lot of putting them down or it's just taking them out of the game and putting somebody else in the spot and they don't really learn from it they just learn like if I mess up I'm out in a sense but right. they were never taught like, hey, let's go to work outside of this. Let's try to get better and stuff like this. Like with high school kids right now, especially on my team, when they're going through slumps, it's they don't go after practice to hit on their own. They don't, they don't reach out at times and stuff like that. So my philosophy has always be is it's hard to coach this generation from when I played in my philosophy. I, I actually loved when I slumped. I loved when I wasn't hitting well. I loved when I wasn't catching well because it just – I loved that type of wanting to get better. Like putting in the work in the, like me and Lila, we call it the lab. Our, our, our tunnels, our lab, our, our facility, that's where we go to work. We're going to put some you know, extra stuff in that sense and really love the grind of it. Because once, once you get the success out of that grind, it's, there's so much more enjoyment that the game provides when you're doing well, obviously. But I, 
I love talking hitting. I love talking and catching with guys that are, or girls that are struggling in that sense because seeing them understand what we're trying to do and then implement it in the game and seeing how they feel after that, I mean, well, as a coach, the philosophy of the base of the game, there's no, there's no better feeling than seeing that transpire and take over. No doubt. Let, let, let's talk about what he just said there. So, Jake or Lila, have you guys ever been in a situation where you felt like if you wasn't playing good in, in, at a younger age or so, um, you felt like you were going to get pulled? Many of times. Yeah. So let's just think about that now. So, you know, let's just take a, a 10-year-old. And if that's the vibe that's on that team, because I think it's it's usually the coach. That's their philosophy is if, you know, we're struggling with one position, we're going to pull and put somebody else in. Now, think about that. What what does that do for you, Jake? Let's just put your, your mind in this 10-year-old. What does that do to you? Now you're even more anxious, right? You're, you're stressing because you know you can't make a mistake. Yeah. Right? How does that make you feel? Uh, it just like sort of makes me feel like bad about myself because then like you put all this work in and then it just goes down the drain and then like your coach doesn't let you play because of how you are performing. I mean, at this age, we're just supposed to learn about how like the game is played and yeah. the coaches sometimes don't really let you do that. Yeah. And you know, let me tell you what I did last week and, and, Y'all can tell me I shouldn't have did this, but so all the coaches that I'm, I coach with was sending these group messages back and forth with the commissioner and saying, you know, getting literally getting nitpicky about rules. And see, I'm I'm from the school of saying, I look, I know the basic rules when we're out at the game. These kids are like nine, ten, eight, nine, ten. Like we can make adjustments on the fly. We can coach all this good stuff. So they're, they're taking it so serious. And I, I, I just, I told my wife, I was like, I'm about to start something. So guess what I did? I sent a text out to all the coaches and I said, wait a minute. Did I just miss something? Are we getting rewarded financially if we win? And obviously the answer is no, Jake. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. But like, but I said it just because like, like relax, it's not, it's, it's like, it's okay. And I think honestly, and Jay, Jake, this is what I tell most kids I talk to, every single game you play right now is practice. Yeah. Until you're getting recruited, and until you're in college and all that fun stuff, it's just practice. Because like, I mean, they may be a scout. I don't know, you ever see a scout out there watching you, Jake, Lila? No. Now, you know what? If I was a scout, I would have came to Cooperstown last year to watch the ball girls because you guys put on a show. But yeah. outside of that situation, you know, yeah, I mean, come on now, chill. I, Josh. Yeah, I uh, real quick. I always told my players yeah. I want them to fail. To be honest with you, like I, I've told many of my catchers, I hope there's a situation where it's a championship game, the last inning, tie ball game, runner on third, and you let a ball go by between the legs and you lose the game. Like, I, I want situations like that to happen or an infielder makes an error to lose the game or something like that because I, I want you to feel what that feels like. And one of the things that I talk to some of my players and my parents when I was coaching 11, 12-year-olds, especially for catchers because that's, like, my main area, is mm -hmm. there's a lot of times where a lot of teams will have their catchers catch the first three innings and substitute them out and have another catcher catch the second, the last three innings, if it's six innings ball game. Right. I never understood it. Because I'm like, you're not putting them in positions to understand how each inning is crucial or how different things happen throughout the game. It's like my catchers, they just rotated. They played all six innings, and the next catcher caught the entire six innings in the next game. And so like, I want them to understand the importance of what the first inning feels like to the last inning as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just like little things like that. Like Especially you talk about scouts. I mean, not at their age, but I know for high school coaches, we go and watch 14-year-old games and who's gonna be coming into our school district because we wanna see, hey, if they make a mistake, like what's their demeanor like? What do they do? What do they, how do they go about their business on the field the rest of the game? Or what are they doing? At a young age, if you just pull kids and you don't let them experience what that's like, they're never gonna understand how to overcome things. Yeah, I mean, and unfortunately that's life. 
I mean, you know, I try to explain it to people. Like, if you don't let, I, I, I try to tell most people this. While a kid's living in your home, let them fail while there's a safety net in everything. Like, let them do it so that they understand how to deal with adversity. I mean, so you guys go and watch some younger kids. How, how do you, what do you look at when you're, let's just say, scouting talent? How do you identify talent? Even from an earlier age, what are you looking for? Um, oof. honestly, I, we don't care about the results of what you're doing base wise in the field. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I care about how do you take the field? How do you, how do you communicate with your players? How do you pick up guys or girls in the field when they make a mistake? How do you keep like, what's your dugout presence, your on deck circle approach of, you know, are you just staying there? Are you getting time down with the pitcher? You know, you have bats. Like, what do they look like? I don't even care if you put the ball in play, but, like, your approach, your swings, things like that. We don't look at stats. We don't look at anything like that. Um, but, you know, character is huge. You know what I mean? You want, you want someone that's coachable, that's going to listen. That's the thing that's one of the hardest things for coaches nowadays is the coachability of players mm -hmm. because there's so many different private lessons, coaches that are involved in each, each you know, athlete. And it's not yep. like – these guys are going to a high school program. They're only listening to those three to four coaches or they have. Like, we had guys that leave our program that week and go to a different pitching coach when we have a pitching coach. Or they go to a different hitting instructor when we have a hitting instructor. And so it's just understanding, like, hey, can you take philosophies from different people and then put it in one to be on the field and coachable by others? So I think from what, you know, most coaches look for is can someone li listen, learn, and adapting the field by being coachable and just a team player in that sense. Yeah, Lila, how coachable are you? <laughs> I try to. This is a loaded question because I've got your coach right here, so I'm <laughs> setting you up here. How coachable are you? I think I'm pretty adaptable. It yeah. kind of depends. All right. All right, Josh, she, she's pretty adaptable. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we fight every now and then. We bump heads, but it's a, you know, it's a very <laughs> lovable relationship. So Lila, Lila's been very fun to work with. You know, she is my only girl I work with, um, and I never worked with a girl that plays baseball. So I know when we started wow. at a young age, she said she wanted to catch, and nobody likes to catch at a young age. It's just not a position people want to do. Um, yeah, usually teams right. – Usually teams just put their best player behind the plate because they can catch the ball. And, yeah. you know, with Lila um, playing, you know, playing baseball, you know, she wasn't the strongest person on the field. She didn't, you know, impress you with arm strength or, you know, bat power and stuff like that. But, you know, one of the things I told her in the beginning as far as the catcher goes, if you can block the ball, you'll, you're going to play. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy. But if you, if you can just keep the ball in front of you because – I mean, you guys have seen it, 10, 10 years old especially, even 11. If you don't block the ball, all you're going to do is get walked. They don't got to steal. They're going to go to second base. They don't got to steal there. They're going to go to third base. And then next thing you know, a pass mm -hmm. ball, and a guy scores or a girl scores, and the hitter never even put the ball in play. So one of the things I stress with Lila is I don't care if you throw runners out right now. I really don't. It's not, a, it's not important to me to throw runners out at 12 years old and under. I care if you can block the ball and frame it. Arm strength will come in time as you get bigger and older. Um, and she just impressed, she impressed everybody. Like I didn't, her work ethic is better than most kids that I know that I've ever worked with. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't get her out of the cage. You can't, you just can't get her inside. And so I actually, <laughs> the funny part, I actually probably owe her money because she's gotten me a lot more clients just watching her play than me actually putting my name out there. So <laughs> they go, they go against her and they're like, who the heck is this girl? And then they all say it's Lila and they go, oh, Lila works with Josh, huh? And next, you know, I get like three or four phone calls the very next day of wanting to get in and get work in. So I said, you know what? We have a, we have a great relationship, but 60-40, man. 60 is her, 40 is me. So it's been a pleasure working with her, and I, I look forward to going forward. Well, good stuff. Lila, you got any questions for Josh? So I know we've talked about, like, confidence issues, like when we get in the game, just having confidence. Um, what do you think kids should like be remembering to have that confidence when they get into the box or like step into the game? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's just think just have the have the confidence that you're better than the pitcher that you're going against. Like just step in the box with confidence that they're not better than you. Um, 
have a mentality and approach of yes, yes. It doesn't matter who they are, but you know, go up to the plate, look and do damage. And if you do it, you do it. And if you don't, who cares? Like it's it's not a big deal. So, yeah, I mean, baseball uses the old analogy all the time of being a Hall of Fame guy hit 300, which is you know, I mean, three hits out of 10, and that's failing in, in, in actual mass. So, the, the math doesn't make sense in, in in our game, but as far as confidence goes, it's just take the field that you're better than everybody else in the field and let things take care of itself. It's There's too many expectations put on kids. There's too many expectations they put on themselves to where they don't need the extra expectations from coaches or even parents. Like, I see parents all the time yell at kids while they're playing, like while they're in the box, trying to coach them up and trying to tell them to do things. I'm just standing there like, they, they're not gonna, they can't make adjustments mid-pitch of what you're trying to tell them and then you're making them think too much. And my biggest thing with them is all the time is who cares if you fail? Honestly, it's not a big deal. You strike out, you strike out. Um, just don't be afraid to strike out. We have too many kids that are okay with wanting to put the ball and play on the ground and get thrown out when strikeout's the same scenario. So um, that's my biggest thing with my players is step in, you're better than everybody else. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Who cares? Go on to the next one. So good stuff. Jake? Can what I ask got? the last question? Yeah. What, the... right now? <laughs> oh, you... He's yawning, <laughs> oh, man. He's yawning. La- you you want to ask the last question of the show? No, like like the normal one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Well, we'll, hold, we'll hold that one. So, okay. all right. Well, um, you know, what I've noticed is, you know, a lot of young coaches, we, we struggle to find coaches you know, around here, outside of travel ball, we really, we struggle. Um, and I'm, what I'm, what I'm realizing is we don't do a good job of supporting the coaches either. Like from a, from a league standpoint, like, you know, if a new coach does want to sign up or a new, you know, a new dad, we don't do a good job of supporting that coach. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's most important is does the individual know how to run or practice? Like, what's a practice look like with you oh. or an effective practice? Uh, it's pretty high intensity for the most part. I my, All of my practices with, with my younger teams was pretty close to high school practices. Um, I, I did it by myself. I was a one-man team. I, didn't, I mean, I had assistant coaches here and there that helped out, but I did a lot mm-hmm. of the majority of all of it by myself. So, um, you know, we do it all, man. We, we take – I take ownership in stretching to begin with and then proper playing catch. And we don't move on until the proper playing catch takes place. Um, you know, we do everything. First and thirds, bunt defenses, you know, run downs, um, cuts and relays, even double cuts at 12 years old, just trying to get them. Everything that was taught to them at that age was preparing them for high school. And I always told them, I said, my biggest goal with you is when you go to a high school program, they look at you and they say, hey, I don't know where this kid came from, but he looks like he knows what he's doing. He knows the game. I don't have to work extra mm-hmm. to get this kid ready for what we have to do. He just molds right into my program or she molds into the program. So, um, you know, hitting was taken seriously. I mean, I like to have fun. We play some games here and there that I've developed or took from other coaches as well just to make it more fun, but it's also working on things. So um, with baseball, it's tough because there's a lot of dead time that's involved. Um, mm-hmm. So just trying to implement things where the kids are constantly moving, constantly learning, asking questions, and you know we use a lot of simulated uh, things. So yep, situational, situational kind of stuff, stuff, putting pressure on them, um, and then honestly, I try my hardest to put them in situations that fail on purpose. Like yep. I don't want them to succeed in certain scenarios. Um, I want to learn from what just happened. So they're not surprised when this takes place in the game and they know how to overcome yep. it. They know how to work to the next pitch. They know how to process things and forget what just happened and move on. Um, so that's pretty much what our practices are generally, generally like. Gotcha. How long are they usually? Um, ooh, not super long. You know I mean? I, I during the week time, uh, we were going two days a week. So we weren't like anything okay. crazy because a lot of our kids go to outside stuff where they went to me personally one on one on the side. So that was kind of a practice as mm-hmm. well. Um, but like our weekday practice, that was during the week. That was more in the fall. That was more um, like hitting in the cage and, and bullpens. And, then on, mm-hmm. and that was probably about two hours. 
And then on Saturdays, I would bump it up to probably three hours because that's when we had the build time. So I want to make sure we got the yep. most opportunities possible. And that's when we did a lot of defense stuff. And then we ended with hitting. Um, on tournaments, there's certain times where I might go three days a week, two is hitting and one's building just because I love being out there and I have nothing else to do. So might as well go play. You know <laughs> what I mean? Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think there's, I've seen some programs that practice like high school, like four or five days a week. I'm just, I think it's crazy, first of all. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, one of the things that I've recommended to our our league is, you know, we need we need the high school coach involved. We need the high school coach having an influence on how practices are ran, you know, what he's looking at, what what's most important at each age level even. You know, six shoe. We should not be yelling and fighting and screaming like I see going on at the park. Like, we got some issues. So, but I, I think, I think that's what we need a lot from our rec leagues is we got to find a way to really help support new coaches, because um, that's honestly, you know, as coaches leave, then parents, you know, they they lose in that one coach that they've always had, and they're really scared to go to another coach. That's a good question. What would you say to a parent that, you know, believes that their kid needs to play for the same coach their entire youth career? Is that a valuable asset, or do you have a different take on it? Um, I think it's to each person. It's it's whatever the situation is. I mean, if that, mm -hmm. if that kid is improving and gelling with that coach, and they have a good relationship, then I mean, by all means, go for it. But I, I'm a firm believer in. If you can have different minds or different coaches and learn different philosophies or how they approach things and try to get all of them, it builds you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think the way you go about that is, is play different sports. So right. by playing different sports, you're getting different coaches, different philosophies, different mentalities. I mean, the game's different of how they approach things. So I think that's why playing different sports is very valuable, not necessarily because of the footwork and whatever it brings to you as an athlete, but you're seeing different mm -hmm. minds and how they approach and how they go about their business. Nowadays, we, baseball is year round. Like there is no, yeah. there is no playing multiple sports. And a lot of teams don't want you to play multiple sports because they are year round. If you play multiple sports, you miss practice. If you miss practice, you don't play. So those parents are put in the situation of what they're supposed to do. So um, I've always encouraged multiple sports and I always will, especially with my kids. They're gonna play multiple sports. I don't know if they're gonna do football, nope. but, um, <laughs> They're gonna play. They're gonna play whatever they want, man. Like, I, I, my daughter has a baseball bat. She, she uses like a golf club. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm the same way. We, we, I'll say I learned very early on in the show um, because I, I was still fresh and back new into the world. And uh, but you know, we had a scout on the the show, and he was a scout for the Mariners, and. Um, you know, Rick said that, you know, his first thing that he looks for when he's recruiting, you know, players into the Mariners organization, or I think it was the Red Sox as well, but um, was a multi-sport athlete. You know, have they played multiple sports, you know, and like just what that does to round off, you know, from a, a baseball player to an athlete. And, you know, and I think that's, there's, there's value. And you just pointed out another value that was clear and obvious right in front of my face that I didn't catch is that also gives you the ability to experience different coaching and that never made those connections. So sometimes it's just the simple stuff. Uh, Lila, any other questions for this dude? So I'm going out to the banana ball tournament in Ohio in August. Um, do you think there's a line that can be crossed between fun and professional in that tournament? <laughs> is this a banana ball tournament style banana ball or is this like legit it is. No, 100 percent 100 percent just do what they do like let loose and i mean <laughs> i went when a banana ball first happened i was like this is a this is a joke like what is going on what is this thing and they were in fresno which is close to us and i went to it with a couple of my buddies and teammates and there was more baseball involved than i actually thought there was like it was like a legit game and they're actually like it's like the globe trotters, but on on you know on baseball time, and they're actually I mean they're good, they're good players, um, yep. and it's fun to watch, man. Like I got to know uh, meet Eric Burns a little bit, and he was very involved in it as well. Um, yep. 
But I think it's a cool thing what they're doing. I think the banana ball tournament just let loose, try a little behind the back, behind the catch thing as a catcher, whatever that guy does. I know you practice it in between games too, but uh, I think it's a great time to understand why the game's fun. You know what I mean? Like, I think the biggest thing I learned was is the team I'm on now for high school, we have good players. We've had D1 pitchers. We've had, you know, a lot of good guys that come through the program. There was a stint where I was at a different high school that is in a demographic area where I mean, kids miss practice. They have to go to work to support their families and their parents and their siblings. They have to go babysit. And they, none of these kids went to travel ball. None of these kids know what baseball is. And it was an eye-opener for me because we weren't good, but they loved being there and they loved playing. And it was yep. fun. And I think that's what I think that's what the banana ball atmosphere is kind of like with the South, too. It's like this game is meant to have fun, and it just has the different things that come with it as well, though. Yep. So... Lila is bringing her own team, <laughs> all the girls, and uh, I'm, I'm the banana ball director. Oh, so right on. I work for the bananas. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we're super excited because I just have this feeling that Lila is going to have a lot of secrets up her sleeve, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm look, I'm yeah, don't give them away, but I, I'm pretty sure you're going to have a few, and I can't wait. So. I don't know any of them, so I, I couldn't tell you. But I'll be watching. Yeah, is it televised? Yeah. Uh, no, it won't be televised. It's a it's a full on tournament. Okay. So um, it will be streaming, I believe, in some capacity. Um, whether Game Changer or there is a streaming service at the complex. Right. But um, but no, that's a good point. We need to we need to stress some uh some media coverage there, of course. Um. All the bananas will be there, so the party animals and the bananas, the whole organization. So we're playing at the Progressive Field in Cleveland the Saturday of the tournament. And so all the players and organization, we're all going to be there at the park, and we're going to put them through all banana ball camps. And so they get to go through that with the players, and then the next day we, we start playing banana ball. I think it's great. And Yeah, we're going to have some fun, Lila. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I <laughs> know for sure, for sure. Um, all right, Jake. Um, any of uh, your questions before we before we ask our final? Uh, you got nothing, anything? Nothing much. Well, look. You know what? You know when I was talking to Lila's mom about this, she said your your second babe could be coming any minute now. So I we look. We made it through the show. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing, you know. <laughs> it would have been great, though, like, for us, if he had to, like, shut the laptop and run away. And, like, that, that it might went viral right there. Her, I don't know. Her due, date, hey. her due date's tomorrow. But she's getting uh, she's getting induced next Tuesday. So we'll see if it hangs on that long. All right. And you, and you, you don't know the sex of the baby, no, I'm understanding. Yeah, we don't know. Mm, how does that make you feel? Um, it's stressful <laughs> right now. Like right now it's stressful, but, uh, honestly it's been, it's fun. Like there's no, I mean, I'm sure it's great either way, knowing or not knowing. I don't know what it's like to know, obviously, because we didn't know for our first one either, but oh, wow. there's no like predetermined expectations of like knowing what it is and yeah. what I get to do with this, with this child. So it's more just preparing for whatever it is, man. Just like what, what parent life is like. So, um, I say it goes by pretty fast for me, but I'm not the pregnant one, so I got, I'm sure it's yeah. not as fast for my <laughs> wife. So, um, yeah. but it, it's been a it's a fun experience. I don't think we'll know any of ours. So even the future ones we have, I don't think we're gonna find out early either. I like that. You know, there there's there's something. I mean, it's cool to know because you know in today's age we have zero patience mm -hmm. because we want everything right now. Um, but I think just that experience of finding out. You know, that first time, I think that's, you know, that's pretty awesome. So, hey, we're talking about having babies on the show. So, that's it. Yeah. No birds and the bees stuff. But, all right, Jake, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to let you deliver the last question. Now, Josh, I'm going to go ahead and preface this. This is usually the hardest question that we get asked. I mean, we, we've stumped some pretty, some pretty good people here. So, Jake, take it over, bud. So you're walking up to play, and uh, you normally have a song. What's gonna be your walk-up song? Ooh, um, I've had a couple. One of my favorites that I've done back in the day was Jake Owen 
uh, Barefoot Blue Green June 9th or however it's said, I think something mm-hmm. like that. It's been a while since I used it. Yeah. Um, Barefoot Blue Jean Night. That was a yep. good one. Was upbeat. I honestly, I wasn't a huge walk up song guy. I was, wasn't a huge thing to me. Um, I had one in college where it was just instrumental music. There's no words, so uh, it's not really. I don't even hear it half the time when I play. To be honest with you, I was Jake talked about it earlier. You know, he's locked in what whatever he's trying to do. So there were sometimes I didn't have one, and my teammates did, and. Uh, wasn't a huge walk up guy, but if I had to say, it was probably that Jake Owens song. That was pretty. That was pretty good for me. Why don't you even bring this guy on the show? You just said don't even like walk up songs. Lila, Lila, really? Lila's first walk up song I remember was like uh, John Cena. That 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 one. I was like, what is going on? And then she has all these different <laughs> ones. But the, I mean, Travel Ball's taking over walk up songs. I remember I saw some some videos like moms changing the songs for the kids to embarrass them and stuff oh, like yeah. that. But. Uh, it's yeah. It's the, Cooper's Town is loaded with walk-up songs when we went. Everybody had it's like a competition of team to team of who can play the song loudest during in in between innings. I just it was it was wild. They didn't let us have them. Uh, we did. We had them. They didn't let you have them. No, they didn't. When we went to Cooper's Town, they didn't let us have walk-up songs. We went the year well, I mean, before you, I think. So they they did for us. They changed it. Well, you must have to pay an extra Did five it? grand for that. Why or something. did you bring it then? Ex- it was pricey. We had to fundraise a lot for that, but it was it was a great. Yeah. I've done it twice. I don't want to do it again, so it was fun. I Lila was supposed to fly me out and go, but otherwise, I I was just yelling at the TV the entire time about things they were doing. So <laughs> I was too. We were up. You know, I, I this is my claim to fame for watching because I pros I really watched, but I was up to like one thirty in the morning that one night watching maggie's stream so i was i was holding on but all right jake any final any you're good the rest of the show you good yep we're about to close it down all right any final thoughts lila so apparently i was wrong we did have walk-up songs i just forgot about them Shocker. i was oh misinformed see that's fake news you, you're putting out fake news lila now I cooper's know, town's gonna man. get mad at me now <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it's okay look we corrected it we corrected it it's okay all right well josh thank you so much for coming on man um i think you know listening to just how you you approach the game um yourself as well as you know help others approach the game i think that's i think it's refreshing for it should be refreshing for coaches um i mean Honestly, if you think about it, the approach you take is less stressful for you too as a coach, right? Am I am I am I right by saying that? No, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of grown men and grown women these days stressing so much about games that at the end of the day really don't matter. Um, and if you take the approach that you know you're here for the kids and you're going to make sure that the kids are a little bit better at the end of the season than they are at the beginning. Hey, you just you take the wins with the losses, and at the end of the day, you chalk it up. You're helping the kids. So, uh, great messages today, uh, Josh, and uh, we'll we'll definitely make sure. I, I think we'll have you back on the show every once in a while, maybe just to help you know give some give some advice to some kids. So, um, Lila, Jake, thank you so much for hopping on with us tonight. I appreciate it very much. Um, Josh, we let you start the show. Uh, we're gonna let you finish it. So at the end of every podcast, we, uh, you know, we, we end the show with, you know, I, I will say a few things here to wrap everything up. And at the end of that, I'm going to say, Josh, until next time. And you're going to say, we will catch you on the slide. Got it? Yep. Lila, you think you got it? Mm, we'll play see. ball is kind of we'll weak. See. I don't know if he's got it. <laughs> All right. Well, look, thank you guys for listening. Please, if this is the first episode you're ever listening to, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, Check us out on YouTube. This episode as well will be on YouTube. Make sure you go subscribe there. And um, thank you again for supporting us, supporting our field reporters. We appreciate it very much. And uh, we we got some cool stuff coming. Uh, Guys, did did I tell you who we're going to have on the show next? Mm Mm-mm. Actually, I don't. Yeah. Um, so, you guys have ever heard of a company called Bruce Bolt? Oh. Are we gonna have Bear? Yeah. 
Bear's yeah. coming. We're going bear hunting, baby. That's coming. And some uh, some really cool stuff from Bruce Bolt's coming as well. So thank you guys again for supporting us. Follow us on all social media accounts. And Josh, how can we follow you on social media? Um, well, Lila actually introduced the name of it. I did. Uh, I, ca- I came up with this. So oh, yeah? you know what it is? J-H underscore brick walls and long balls. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, that's good. That's that to go good on a t-shirt. But anyway, cool. Follow Coach Josh. Until next time. We'll catch you on the slide. We thank you for toughing it out and pushing through. Now, let's go teach the world great sportsmanship, leadership, to go inspire someone through your dedication and excitement for the game. Make sure to smash the like and follow button on all social media at the Slide Podcast Show and the Slide Pod on Twitter. Plus, leave us a review and feedback. Until next time. Until next time, we'll catch you on the slide. On the slide.